Okay, we are back for the, the final segment. Um, I've got the Quad City Times political focus group here. It's been a pretty interesting night, I would say. Um, a lot of agreement, a lot of disagreement. So we're going to kind of land on this big question, what's at stake in this election? And I've actually asked this question to a certain extent, uh, and you've written some responses. So um, I'm going to kind of open the floor, raise your hand, uh, if you want to tell me what you think's at stake in this election. Yeah. I'm concerned about the truth. There was a cognitive declining candidate in 2020. I could see it. People that wanted to see it could see it. It continued downhill. They covered it up. Kamala Harris can't wash her hands of this. I don't know who it is, whether it's Jill Biden running the show or Kamala had to have an extreme amount of influence because Joe Biden, I, 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 I hold him blameless for everything. The poor guy is ill. And we have people that knew all about it and waited until they finally said, hey man, we got to get rid of this guy. Let's have an early primary and put him out in front of America. Because America wasn't seeing him because America doesn't want to see stuff like that. They watch the shows they want to see. They didn't want to see, the, the people that like Joe Biden didn't want to see his decline. And here we are, they, they threw him overboard, we got the second stringer in there, so, and now, that's what's at stake. So, truth is at stake? Is that what you're saying? What? The truth, truth is at stake, and, and the filibuster and the packing of the Supreme Court, I just find that, to, that's the threat. Democracy is a threat to our republic. That's what I would say. So let me, let me just drill down a little bit on that, Eugene. So if truth is ex at stake here, so do you feel like Donald Trump is elected, then we will have a truthful I, administration? Well, Donald Trump says a million things. And <laughs> when I say I'm the greatest orator in Moline, maybe I'm not. But I said it. Now, does that make me a liar, or does that just make me a guy that bloviates a little bit? So right, Donald Trump right. is what Donald Trump is. I've seen him for... 40 years. I Would there be more was. truthfulness in his administration than with Joe Biden? Is that what Oh, absolutely. About? I trust him. Okay. I love the guy. All right. Who else, who else wants to talk about what's at stake here? Seems like a lot. Who, raise your hand if you've got something. Yeah, Paula. Um, th this election for me, I feel like the thing, and I guess maybe it's just because I'm a woman, but the thing that's most at stake for me is um, it was really a kick in the teeth to lose Roe versus Wade. Um, I really do feel that every woman has a right to an abortion, doesn't need any questions about it. It's between her and her doctor. She has a right to choose. It's her life. It's her body. Um, and I really do feel like I could never vote for a president or a candidate or anybody who ever even out loud stated that they would consider a ban on abortion in all the states. Um, I feel really bad for women right now in states where they've basically lost a whole access to an abortion. Um, I feel like that really victimizes women in a lot of ways. I come from a family where um, we have a lot of very strong, independent women who work really hard and we are capable of making those decisions for ourselves and we don't make any man donate blood to save anybody's life. I'm not going to donate my body to save anybody's life. Um, and if my daughter ever gets in any kind of predicament where she needs to make a choice for any certain reason, that she should be able to make that choice because we're women, we're smart, they're our bodies, and we have the right to choose. And how many laws are that regulate men's health? Not a single one. True. Right. Who else? Uh, so we've got truth and abortion so far. What else is at stake, Laura? Um, for myself personally, I think a lot of people my age is um, the climate. Um, and I think with Trump's rhetoric and from the Republican Party, they've completely called like a hoax, which is really scary, um, especially because I'm hoping to have like a full life until I'm your guys' age. Um, but I think like to call it a hoax is to completely like not live in reality, as we see, like there's a whole, <laughs> there's like a whole like um, hurricane right now, and the temperature is like the hottest it's ever been, and the winds are as hot as it's ever is ever going to be. And I think us in Iowa are very privileged because we live in the middle of the country. But people that are in Florida or on the coast or in other countries like India or Africa, like they're really going to suffer. Um, 
And if you don't do something about it, then people of my generation are going to have to deal with an even worse problem. And yeah. Do you feel like the candidates are talking enough about climate? Um, not really. It hasn't really been a major topic, but I'm hoping with this hurricane that it will become more into focus. But it really hasn't. It's been a lot of like the economy. Um, and I think it's important to talk the about the economy, but I also think that environment is an aspect of the economy. Like, if, if everything gets destroyed because of, like, we see it in the Quad Cities, like the, the flood is happening like almost every couple of years now, and it affects businesses and stuff like that. Okay. Who else wants to tell me what's at stake? David. I feel one of the biggest issues, and I've written about it a lot in my comments, is around economic mobility. And the fact that, um, according to Pew Research, we're now seeing the fastest increase in the wealth gap in America. Uh, and it feels to me that the bottom rungs that were there for us when in the, in the 80s and 90s and 2000s to, to make it through education into the workforce and to get good jobs and to aspire to own our own homes and, and to, to, to take care of our families, those rungs are disappearing. Um, the cost of college has gone through the roof. And, so I feel what's at stake here, and you see very different opinions on the future of education, is you know, how do we preserve the American dream? And how do we preserve access to the opportunities of America that needs to be protected? And both candidates have a lot to say on both sides. Yeah. Matthew? I, I would agree with David on that. I think um, the, the, what is at stake is the opportunities we have for young people and for future generations going forward. Um, I think there's a lot of policies that can help with that, including building more housing, including um, you know, restructuring some of our education systems so that way they are a little bit more affordable and more accessible. Um, job training, access to quality jobs. I mean, education, like I said before, even, even at, at a basic public school level, um, you know, our communities need opportunities in the future and our young people really need to know that there is something out there for them and that they want to look forward to that. Okay, Jonathan. I'm going to go in a different direction. Um, and in some ways, I do agree with uh, a number of, of what's been said here. But I, I, to me, I would say national security is very much at stake. And in part, part of our national security is tied directly to our economics. We have to be an economically stable country with, mod with low, if any, inflation if we're going to be a stable country. But we also have to be willing to implement a strong border defense. We have to make sure that we are supporting, without question, our allies when they come under attack. And we can't be defending nations to which we do, are not formally <coughs> allied and may not actually even be truly on uh, truly friendly terms with. We have to have we have to look after American interests first before we are looking after any of these other things. And unfortunately, what we've had for many years and under both Republican and Democrat presidents, is an investment in all the rest of the world, but yet we've got problems here at home that don't go unaddressed, that continually go unaddressed. Okay. Here in, the, here in the Quad Cities, we just replaced the 74 bridge, which should have been replaced 20 years before. We've got the AI-80 bridge. To keep that bridge up and running, we are having to constantly have it under repair almost now every single year. They're saying that that's going to come up, but who knows? It took them, they were talking for 20 years about replacing 74. They've only just started talking about replacing 80 within the last couple. How long is that going to take? So you're, you're talking about uh, just investing in America instead of overseas? And we've, got to, we've got to invest at home. We've got to make sure we have a strong military. We have to have so strong you, borders. Were you talking about it's Ukraine earlier when you said every uh, our national security literally covers every single part of our life, from our elections to our economy to our immigration system. There's not a point that at which if one area starts to fall, eventually 
America becomes a weak country and other countries that are hostile to our interests, for instance at the moment Russia and China and Iran, and they're going to start eating away at what uh, our interests, we're going to grow and continually weaker and eventually we're not going to have much of a country anymore. Okay, all right. Who else? Uh, Matt, you haven't said anything yet about what's at stake. <laughs> you know, I'm on a downslope of this. I'm 72, so uh, it's interesting. I think there's all kinds of things. I think, uh, I think women's rights are, are not talked about enough. I think the, the Republicans stepped on their lip, so to speak, uh, uh, you know, by all coming out against it. Now they're, oh, we're losing votes here and there and everything, and now we're for it. I think climate change, I'm hoping the toothpaste isn't out of the tube. You know, and I don't know what can be done to uh, to uh, overcome that. But the Republican Party sure hasn't said anything about it. I mean, they're still in denial about it. Now, maybe the the, the Democrats are forcing, you know, thinking about spending too much money to do this too soon. But something has to be done. People that are 20 or 25 are going to be living in a sauna here, and and. 40 years, and that's just the science. The Gulf of Mexico increases almost a half a degree. I mean, it just keeps going up, and that's why you see these superstorms coming up through the through the Gulf, and that's going to continue. Um, and you think political leadership can uh, help that? I think so. It, 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 who else is going to? Uh, corporate greed isn't going to help it. I mean, uh, uh, at some point you have to just make government and not for government regulations, because there's too many of them, but you're going to have to regulate some of this stuff. And uh, if we're going to be a country that leads by example, that's what we're going to have to start with, I think. Okay. So, Jessica and Tim, I don't think I've heard from you on what's at stake. Jessica, do you want to go? I have two things, actually. The first one is the amount of control the government has over your life. And I think, for me, going through COVID, that was kind of like the first time I realized how much the government could control me. They could control my speech. They could control my body. They could control my job. And then we went into January 6th. They can control my bank account. They can look and see where I'm using my credit card. And so that, that has me worried and concerned. Um, we talk about women's rights and how we, women should have control of their bodies. By putting it back to the states, that's giving women the opportunity to go to their state legislatures and saying, these are the laws that we want on our books, and to fight for that. Because the state legislature is going to be more responsive to you than the federal government. The federal government, we send so many tax dollars there, but what do we really get back? When you look at what happens on the state level for people, it's more responsive. The second thing is free speech. We don't have a town square anymore. We don't have people standing up on soapboxes and giving speeches, and everybody's allowed to hear them. Instead, we have social media. And what we've discovered when Elon bought Twitter is that people were being censored. They were being silenced. My account got banned. Um, I have to be very careful about what I say on Facebook, or I get in Facebook jail. So we need to really look at what our Constitution says about these things, and we need to vote for politicians that are not are going to take the Bill of Rights seriously. They're not going to take away my guns. They're not going to make me bake a cake I don't want to bake or give birth control to people if I'm a nun. We have to make sure that our government is going to protect those 10 rights that are enumerated. And they're enumerated for a reason, because they're important. OK, thanks, Jessica. Tim, you want to finish this off here? much time as Jonathan had. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was thinking why I heard all this. Uh, first day of law school, the professor walks in, he screams at the room. And what he screamed was, don't listen to those, don't listen to the town, don't listen to the tone, listen to the words. In other words, don't somebody shout you down and think because they're loud, they get to be heard. And I'm not talking about Gene just because he's <laughs> Trump's that guy in my mind. He talks over people, he doesn't want to hear disagreements. He's never said he's sorry about anything in his life. I, I'm probably the only person in the room that's read all 163 pages of Jack Smith's 
submission to the court. And it does help. I'm a lawyer and you can read that. But when I read that, clearly January 6th was something he wanted to happen. And I heard a great quote a long time ago from a history professor that we hire presidents to do one or two, three really hard things during their term. Bay of Pigs, Cuban Missile Crisis, COVID, um, whether it's in the Afghanistan or Iraq or neither. Just think about those things and what happened when those decisions were made. Kennedy screws up the missile crisis. You know, the communists get, Nick Khrushchev gets to increase his control over a much larger part of the world. Things are different then. So while they may mess up, the little things do not get things done. Kennedy clearly messed up Vietnam and Johnson made it worse. There are things that we hire those guys to do and if we get lucky, they do it right. So I don't expect whoever's sitting in the Oval Office to do everything right when they ask Harris how she's going to get things passed. She may not know because she doesn't know what Congress is going to look like. So you have to hope for the best, but hope that the person sitting there is thinking about us and not themselves. And I cannot get past January 6th. Yes. He, he put it in motion, he lit the flame, he sat back in his office and watched it on TV and said, so what? This, I Can like you it too. About January 6th? Yeah, yeah. Really Can I just finish my part? Yeah, yeah. I, just, I just want to know if we can continue yeah. on. So to me that's you know that's that's where we're that's that's to me it's it's I think it's disqualifying not to not to do this, not to let not let things go. But we you know to me we're hiring for the best the best person. I like the joy that Harris brings to the campaign. I happen to know Tim Walz. He was a congressman when I was a college president of Minnesota. He, he, what you see is what you get. Uh, he is just a happy guy who wants to do good things, and he is progressive. Um, and he's been a really good governor. So, you know, I'm, I'm there, but I, the last thing I'd say is this. The other thing they teach in law school is you're entitled to your opinion, you're not entitled to your facts. 64 judges told Trump and his attorneys there was no election fraud. If you don't like it, great, that's your choice, but that's a fact. And that's where I'm at. All right. Do, do, do we have a consensus? Do we want to talk about January 6th? Um, because we're getting close to the end here. Um, okay. But can we, can we keep um, it on facts? Not, I think from Fox, I well, heard it on the internet. No, I think we need well, to talk about our reactions a, to January 6th. This is everybody's opinion. Okay. What's is so interesting like is it. that we all had different reactions to the same event, and that's yeah. what I want to talk about. Yeah. All right. Jack, Jack, that, you like got the floor. Too. Merv Havenick was a our Hall of Fame coach at Bettendorf. Our big rivalry was Assumption. So I liken this, and I'm not so Jack, Jack Smith can prove any that he was directly responsible for it. I think he is, but I don't think he can be proven in court. But it would be like Merv Hobbinick going to his football team and saying, come on, let's go liberty, beat Assumption, or smack, da, 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 and then watch his team run across the field, jump into the stands, and beat the Assumption <laughs> fans to death as he went and got a hot dog. Because that's what this man did. He sat and ate a cheeseburger while this was going on. And there was no president in, that ever existed that would have done that. No man, no woman of any consequence would have allowed followers to do what they did without going down there and trying to stop it. I can't get past it. As, as Tim said, 64 judges said it was. And 33 of those he appointed, told them seven states that he thought all that were Republican states told them there was no election fraud. Now, did Al Gore question Florida? Yes. Hillary probably questioned. But at once it was determined that they lost, they shut up about it. This man for four years. You talk about truth, Eugene? He, for four years he's been saying that election's been stolen, and I just can't ever get past that. Do you ever read the Quad City Times? The first district in Marion, Miller Meeks, when she defeated loser-elect Rita Hart. There were letters to the editor over and over about the discrepancies in the first district. The uh, counting of military ballots was done unevenly. Standards were applied differently in various areas. They wrote letter after letter, and, and when it came down to, uh, there was a question of whether uh, Nancy Pelosi would seek Miller Meeks, but they couldn't really say 
that there was fraud in the first district of Iowa if there was no fraud anywhere else. The most secure election in, in history in the middle of a pandemic and, and all of the riots. That's just ludicrous to say. I'm not saying Trump won, but I'm saying the year leading up to January 6th, there were riots that were all over the country, and local prosecutors just let the people out. Kamala Harris raised money in Minnesota to get them out. They made it so that rioting was almost legal. Mm -hmm. So when you come to January 6th, and you've got this mob of a thousand people out of probably, what, 50,000 that were there? And they were misguided, they were deluded, and if you look at some of the criminal records and stuff, these people were, were crazy, a lot of them. So they went in there and they, they, they totally did the wrong thing, and for whatever reason, our side won't cut them loose. Uh, I throw them under the bus right off the bat. If you, some grandmother says, I just walked in, I thought it was open. You say, in the middle of a ride, you wandered into a Walmart, and you didn't know you couldn't do that. It, there's, that both sides are disingenuous. The, the committee was a kangaroo court, and then Tucker Carlson comes out and says, hey, I got a picture of a guy not doing anything. That means nothing happened. So there's just two lies, and nobody can really tell the truth, that in a year, where there was rioting going on all over the place and we had the pandemic and we were in a national state of craziness. They're just that. All right, we do need to wrap up. I know Jessica wanted to talk. Um, I just wanted to say that what kind of what he was saying that we, we sat there the summer of 2020 and watched all this go down. And I remember turning to my husband and I said, if our side gets riled up like this, it's not going to be good. And I was off work that day, so I happened to be home, and I happened to be watching the news. And I saw all these different camera angles. And so I saw the police moving the rope line, moving the gate, letting people in on one side of the building. And on the other side of the building, you had people beating the cops with flagpoles. And we have all the video. We could sit down and we could watch it all, and we're all going to have a different response to it, depending on how we feel about Donald Trump. Should he, should he have done more? Maybe. But at the same time, I thought Seattle should have done more. I thought Portland should have done more. I thought Kenosha should have done more. I thought all these cities that were on fire in the summer should have done more. And it just goes to show that our divide is so bad that if we don't have a legal system that you can trust to be fair and impartial, it's just going to continue to get worse because we have such inconsistency. We have people that were kept in jail way too long because of January 6th and their rights were violated, and we have people that were let out who were trying to kill cops in Portland. So, so I, I, I think we found uh, an issue where we don't agree, yeah. and that's January 6th. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I do want to thank everybody for coming and uh, you know being brave enough to to tell me what you think about these issues, putting your sticking your neck out a little bit, um, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I do feel like we um, we trust each other here, um, and uh, so I feel like it's been a good experience. And I, I just want to thank you for that. And I think we're going to close out. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.